queering classical poetics, what does it mean? And is queer a verb now? If so, does it mean to turn something queer or does it mean to query the lens with which one looks upon it? But have we ever known whether meaning was created at the origin or point of reception? We might first posit with the Oxford English Dictionary that the term queer denotes a sexual or gender identity that does not correspond to established ideas of sexuality and gender, especially heterosexual norms. And then we might note that the word seems to move outward from there. In the words of Eve Kozofsky Sedgwick, queer refers to, quote, the open mesh of possibilities, gaps, overlaps, dissonances, and resonances, lapses and excesses of meaning when things aren't made or can't be made to signify monolithically. Though, though these things in her article have to do with gender and sexuality, Sedgwick adds later in the same essay, that quote, a lot of the most recent work around queer spins the term outward along dimensions that can't be subsumed under gender and sexuality at all. The ways that race, ethnicity, post-colonial nationality crisscross with these and other identity constituting identity fracturing discourses, for example. So given that these words appeared in an essay first published in 1993, one can only begin to imagine how much further outward, indeed how galactically wide, the reach of the term queer has become in the 30 years since then. Accordingly, queer is a word at times accused of meaning nothing because it might mean everything. No one suspects that it is the power of the term, not the threat of its dissolution, that causes its accusers distress. To be sure, the reach and depth of the word changes as it moves through the work and worlds of an ever greater number of people. If it began as a pejorative slur aimed at those who did not conform to norm normative expectations of sexuality, if it was then appropriated by these same nonconformers and their supporters, so too has it been strengthened by widening to include many ways of not falling in line with socially Im uh, imposed enclosures of hierarchical norms, such as gender, family, race, time, structures of life and attention. It is an orientation from which one might most spectacularly try to map out or even determine an unseen utopic future, as when, for example, Jose Esteban Munoz posits that a posterior glance at different moments, objects, and spaces might offer us an anticipatory illumination of queerness. Indeed, he adds, to access queer visuality, we may need to squint, to strain our vision and force it to see otherwise, beyond the limits the limited vista of the here and now. And so with one squinty eye on this idea of the future, I turn back toward the querying of the poetry of the past. So in this talk today, I trace a particular thread into and through a few bits of classical poetry by way of a few bits of poetry that are just one generation old. Starting with the material closest to the present, the poems are from the 1990s, I move jaggedly back into the past. In doing so, I espouse the ancient Greek idea that the space just behind us, so the word is opiste, behind you, is the place to find the future. The past by this light lies right before our eyes, and the forthcoming is just behind. Thus, to see what is in store for us, we must crane our necks and look back. I borrow also from Heather Love the trope of the backward turn, her pushback against the will for progress, or what she calls a linear triumphalist view of history her framing of the gesture of looking back, as performed by Lot's nameless wife looking back on Sodom, by Odysseus looking back at the sirens, and by Orpheus looking back on Eurydice, an instance which has also been framed by Shane Butler as the backward glance. From this stance, we can begin to build out a repertoire of life lived in the moment of looking at or for another person, of figuring out and configuring of decoding, cajoling, queering, and queering that other and oneself at a crux of hate and love, those affective forces burning at their brightest. For hate and love as such, and also the two affects as they can join, are really just the starkest forms of orientations towards others and towards the world. The theorist Sarah Ahmed asks how sexual orientation might be thought of as a question of how we occupy the phenomenolo phenomenological space of our lives. If orientation is a matter of how we reside in space, then sexual orientation might also be a matter of residence, 
of how we inhabit spaces as well as who or what we inhabit spaces with. If we foreground the conception of orientation, then we can re-theorize the sexualization of space as well as the spatiality of sexual desire. She adds, moreover, that in order to become oriented, one must first have an awareness of the experience of disorientation. The poems I examine here combine these two modes of orientation and directionality. The disorientation that causes the desire for direction, the look back that brings a kind of answer, if not the one that was sought. So there are going to be three parts of uneven length. <clears throat> So I begin this movement backwards with a turn towards the 1990s, a time of growing desperation in the gay movement, which was buckling under the overwhelming multitude of losses that AIDS had generated already, and the ongoing failure of political and medical institutions to combat or even recognize the crisis. Indeed, two anthologies of poetry written in relation to the epidemic, the first published in 1989 and the second in 1997, show an instructive shift in perspective between the mood of the late 80s and that of the movement one decade later. Thus, the editor of the second volume, so this is the 1997 one, wrote in his introduction, this anthology is different and yet complements Poets for Life, so that's the earlier one, because the poetry is marked by the big gestures of the elegist leaving the bedside and looking at the whole fractured world, what the world has become with AIDS in it. Here then is another picture of the poet in an affective mode. The poet as elegist is framed in the moment of looking, though not of looking back, but rather looking at the totality of a world that includes debilitating loss as a constitutive and ongoing part of it. The scholar Monica Pearl has written of the latter moment of the 90s in view of the Freudian distinction between mourning and melancholia. The problem for gay men in the time of AIDS with adhering to what is considered the normal process of mourning is that the normative working through of loss requires that the ego decide not to share in the fate of the lost object. But for gay men in the time of AIDS, the mourning ego is melancholic in that there is often no possibility of deciding not to share in the fate of the lost object when one is not only potentially on the same downward mortal course, but the loss that, that is being worked through is bound to happen again and again. The loss, then, is always already happening. Pearl's point, then, is that in these circumstances, loss stops being merely an event and becomes an ongoing state of being, almost a space of residence. To frame the mood or problem as that of a multitude of people or through the abstraction of psychoanalytic feeling, or even by way of the ritual of mourning, however, is to risk missing the singularity of each particular haunting loss. The stance is better captured, I suggest, in poetry than in prose, theory, or history. So I start with three poems by Frank Bedart from a volume called Desire that he published in 1997. So here's the first poem. It's called In Memory of Joe Brainerd. The remnant of a vast oceanic bruise, wound delivered early and long ago, was in you purity and sweetness self-gathered, chosen. When I tried to find words for the moral sense that unifies and sweetens the country voices in your collage, the friendly way, you said, it's a code. You were a code I yearned to decipher. In the end, the plague that full swift runs by took you, broke you. In the end, could not take you, did not break you. You had somehow erased within you not only meanness but anger, the desire to punish the universe for everything, not achieved, not tasted, seen again, touched. The undecipherable code unbroken, even as the soul learns again the body it loves and hates is made of earth and will betray it. So even before I try to understand the words of the poem, I am drawn to decode its Typography, so not like it's topography, but a typeface. Right? So the coming and the going of the italics, the expressive quality of its spacing, its variegating punctuation. The poem seems to be built from a certain exact formalism with its own set of self-creating rules, rules that determine a set of very specific decisions that I, the reader, yearn to decipher. For some, there is something unusually intimate happening here in the presentation of this poem in its orientation toward its reader. It seems that Frank Bedart, 
the person who is and is not the speaker, is speaking to Joe Brainerd, an actual person whose name we receive in the title and only in the title. This title, the only part of the poem that regards Brainerd in the third person, follows the formula of a memorial for someone lost to death, as indeed Joe Brainerd was, having died of pneumonia related to AIDS in 1994. An I, you poem, a love poem, a poem of loss addressed by me to you is pretty standard fare in the world of lyric poetry, but this one brings the you right in and also keeps you out. In much the way that Bedart brings you, the reader, right to the brink of his longing for this you, and then when you, the reader, find that you can't get any closer to the story of this longing, you may find that this injection of distance has much to do with how he, Bedart, also cannot get any closer, like Orpheus couldn't get any closer to Eurydice, for example. This inability to close the gap between the speaker's I and his you seems to result both from the fact that Brainerd has died and also from the conclusion that he, that is you, were a code. That's there. For Bedart, telling his reader that he yearned to decipher the code that was you reveals to us that he could not do so even before Brainerd died, that even during his lifetime, there was already in Brainerd the undecipherable code unbroken. Brian Glavey, writing of this poem, states that Bedart reads the absence wrought by Brainerd's loss as already present within Brainerd's work, conflating Bedart's view of Brainerd's personhood with Brainerd's artistic productions, which we will come to shortly. But I think it is important to distinguish here between absence and indecipherability. Absence is easily glossed as non-presence, but indecipherability is a very present stance. Indecipherability, after all, can be understood as a loud refusal, a hard line of both abeyance and self-containment. Brainerd's perceived refusal to be deciphered, his refusal of the possibility of being decoded even in life, is in alignment, in fact, with his refusal to be broken even as the plague, which is AIDS, also took you, broke you, even as in the end it could not take you, did not break you. One can get a little lost between the possibilities. Brainerd has been broken away from Bedart, but the code that he was in life was not broken. So the subject split here into two subjectivities, and also maybe surprisingly for its very traditionality, into body and soul in the final lines of the poem. The indecipherable code, unbroken even as a soul, learns once again the body it loves and hates is made of earth and will betray it. And here my own orientation is also split in several ways, for at this juncture there are a few directions that I want to move toward all at once. One is to another poem of Bedart, one is to the Homeric Achilles, one is to Bedart plus Catullus, one is to Joe Brainerd himself, and one is to Greek lyric and elegiac poetry, and one is to Plato. Um, the remainder of my talk does all of those things, um, not all at once, but piece by piece, as one must in an attempt to carve out a directionality that translates the sense of immanence that all of these have for me in one teeming moment of confronting the ending of this one poem. So, I'm going to do the Bedart poem first. Um, the poem in memory of Joe Brainerd is followed in that same collection, Desire, by another one called The Yoke. Or just, yeah, Yoke. Don't worry, I know you're dead, but tonight turn your face again toward me. When I hear your voice, there is now no direction in which to turn. I sleep and wake and sleep and wake and sleep and wake and... But tonight, turn your face again toward me. See, upon my shoulders is the yoke that is not a yoke. Don't worry, I know you're dead, but tonight, turn your face again. The poem asks it's you to turn your face again toward me three times. The relationship between the words turn your face again and toward me gets ever more distanced, however, as the poem proceeds. So in the, f in the lines share one stanza the first time they appear in italics that seem to signal a kind of inset intimate dialogue. Then in the crisp mode of reality inflected regular typeface, the same words recur but are split from each other by a stanza break. And finally, the poem ends with merely the line, turn your face again. Readers conditioned by repetition may hear the word toward me again, but if they hear it at the end, they will be hearing its absence, as if the speaker has learned that there is no me anymore to the you who is dead. There's no chance of recognition from the entreated, only the entreaty of the one that looks back remains. 
The yoke then starkly frames one way of looking back that can be an orientation of one person toward another, an orientation that is itself a form of supplication, not the institutionalized ancient form that is enacted by putting, you put one hand on someone's knees and the other hand on their chin, but a different pose, like that of Achilles at the end of the Iliad, who also cannot sleep and cannot stop asking Patroclus to return to him. Twice he is shown in a struggle with sleep. The first time he dreams of a dissatisfied Patroclus, one who complains of his wandering state as a wraith and that Achilles is neglecting him. The soul of wretched Patroclus came in all ways like himself, in size and beautiful face and voice and in such clothes as he had worn. And as he stood by his head and, and he stood by his head and spoke this word, you sleep for you have forgotten me, Achilles. When I loved you, you were not unmind unmindful of me. Sorry, when I lived, you were not unmindful of me, but just when I am dead. Bury me quickly as you can so that I may try the gates of Hades. The souls of the dead, the phantoms, they keep me at a distance and do not let me mingle with them by the river. But in vain I wander through the wide gated house of Hades. And give me your hand. I grieve, for never back again will I come from Hades when you have given me my dew and fire. At this point, Achilles begs Patroclus for an embrace and begs him, in essence, to be part of a dual construction once again for just a little while. But no luck. The soul of Patroclus disappears like smoke in an attempted embrace that becomes paradigmatic in all classical literature to follow as the mode of attempting and failing to hold the dead. Notably, a nighttime visitation is also the situation of the poet Tom Gunn uh, that he frames as happening 10 days or so after the loss of a loved one to AIDS in a poem called The Reassurance. About 10 days or so, about 10 days or so after we saw you dead, you came back in a dream. I'm all right now, you said, and it was you. Although you were fleshed out again, you hugged us all around then and gave your welcoming beam. How like you to be kind, seeking to reassure, and yes, how like my mind to make itself secure. The dream of the dead loved one is more reassuring for gun speaker than for Achilles. The dead beloved, after all, says that he is all right. Moreover, he is fleshed out again and beaming. The dead beloved, in other words, is and does precisely what Patroclus is not and cannot do for Achilles. Patroclus is not fine and he cannot embrace even for a little while. Yet Gunn notes, unlike Achilles, that what he has seen is a product of his own mind, seeking to make itself secure. The modern telling then gives comfort, but takes away the possibility of any true encounter with a lost love, even a torturously unsatisfying one. The ancient encounter plays on the limb of lack of satisfaction and actual exchange. The second time Achilles struggles with sleep because of his grief over the death of Patroclus comes in the final book of the Iliad. Here he tries to sleep but finds himself weeping instead, tossing, turning, and remembering. But Achilles wept, remembering his beloved companion, and sleep, though all conquering, did not hold him. Instead, he tossed this way and that, longing for the manhood and strength of Patroclus, and unwinding in his mind all the pains he had suffered with him as he moved through wars of men in the arduous waves. Recalling these things, he let fall fresh tears, and now lay on his side, now again on his back, and then prone. Then rising up, he would whirl about, wandering on the shore of the sea. So thus the Iliad, our earliest Greek epic, is known as a story about the Trojan War, but devolves upon the longing of one man in his struggle to sleep and wake, and sleep and wake, and sleep and wake, and... Rather than sleeping peacefully at the start of either of the last books of the Iliad, we find him looking back, remembering, begging for a small respite from a condition of having no direction in which to turn, of being without orientation. This is to say that Frank Bedart's The Yoke and Tom Gunn's The Reassurance, however personal these accounts, are also instances of poetry that are well situated by our own looking back to Homer's early and exquisite portrait of looking back. In his sleeplessness, Achilles feeds his yearning by feeding his hatred of Hector's corpse, which also feeds Apollo's fury. For as Apollo puts it, in mutilating Hector's corpse, he abuses the dumb earth. Achilles has not, like Brainerd, or as Bedart sees Brainerd, possessed 
progressed past anger, right? Where he says, you had somehow erased within you not only meanness, but anger, the desire to punish the universe for everything, and so forth. If Brainerd is made perfect in Bedart's vision, and more on this below, then Achilles, by contrast, is haunted by the knots of the past and yet to come, and ends up hating what he can hate, the body of his companion's killer, a body that can no longer feel anything. By contrast, Bedart's Brainerd, his you, has, in his eyes, performed a perhaps unrepeatable or even unbelievable act of self-erasure, with all the hate effaced for all achievements, tastes, sights, and touches not accessed. And yet the hate resurfaces, but is now in possession of the abstracted soul. <clears throat> so this is the undecipherable code, unbroken, even as the soul learns once again, the body it loves and hates is made of earth and will betray it. So here we are, back with Homer's Apollo, back reminding ourselves that the body is just made of earth, and in its dumbness, its refusal to speak to us, its existence itself is betrayal. But who is betraying whom here? Who is the self? Who is the other? So let us keep going, moving backwards, that is, back to two poems in Bedart's collection and back 2,000 years in poetic history, back again into the classical. Bedart's poem is this. Catullus excrucior, I hate and love. The sleepless body hammering a nail nails itself, hanging crucified. So in this short poem, we have a kind of mashup of Catullus with our insomniac Achilles, plus a touch of Christ. And so here's Catullus, poem 85. Odiet amo, quere id faciam fortasse requeras, nescio, sed fieri sentio ed accrucior. I hate and I love. How can I do this, perhaps you ask? I don't know, but I feel it happen and I am tortured. Whom does Catullus's speaker hate and love? We are not told this. Importantly, the hate and the love have no object. It is hate and love as affects that matter, as orientations toward. In this sense, the object of this toward takes on an aspect of irrelevance. Yet there is a you in the poem, but this you turns out to be a you who queries, an outside observer, an almost third person you, the one who asks or who might ask, but how do you do this? How can you hate and love at the same time? Is this question asked in doubt, in mockery, in love, in incredulity? Is Catullus a code that this you longs to decipher? Or is this inquisitive you really just Catullus's I? Since after all, the you has not asked the question in question, but is only imagined in the poem as doing so. In any case, the speaker has no answer for his questioner except to declare disorientation. I don't know. What he does not know has to do with the how of his affectivity the potently paradoxical quality of his orientation, the and. Thus he names the paradox, hate and love, and then refuses to unravel it. But, said, he insists upon it nonetheless, even more so, its reality as feeling, that's fieri sentio, and its depth in agony, excrucior. And as he does so, his affective stance ceases to be split into two orientations towards, one hate and two love, but rather becomes one united turn inward, or turn backwards perhaps, into the verbal passivity of being tortured. Benjamin Eldon Stevens links the famous Catullus 85 to Catullus 68a, in which the poet declares himself so disappointed by love that he can no longer produce poetry, fundamentally silenced from his intrinsic method of existence within a book of poetry. Stevens writes, the best or most erotic Catullus can do is to recall the location of an earlier sexual liaison. In the context of displacements, it is worth emphasizing that already at the time of the liaison, that location was borrowed, and so would necessarily mean a kind of dislocation. It is worth noting that spatial and emotional dislocation, or let's say disorientation in poem 85, find their parallel in Stevens' acute interpretation of Catullus 68a. But back to Bedard who takes Catullus' name and the final word of Catullus' poem and translates Catullus' first three words pretty literally, odi et amo, right, that glaring declaration. He does so, however, as in the poem for Joe Brainerd, through a kind of typographical encoding, I hate and love. So why the dash, right, why the italics? Is it to show us that this voice is a different one for this part of the poem? 
If so, is the italicized voice the sleepless voice? Is it the voice of you? Is this the voice of the soul? So the last one, the soul might be right on some level, not only because the rest of Bedart's short poem veers off into an image of Christian crucifixion or self-sacrifice, making an apparent distinction or even antagonism between the body and soul seem appropriate, but also because this little poem turns out to be a key to deciphering the end of the poem in memory of Joe Brainerd, if indeed we as readers want to decipher it. Because remember how it ends with, even as the soul learns once again that the body it loves and hates is made of earth and will betray it. And remember how the next poem in the collection is, let me get there, the one called The Yoke. In that poem, the I has become an Orpheus who's sleeplessly begging the you, though dead, to turn the face back toward me. So when we put it all together, the reach to Catullus, the reach for Christian crucifixion, the reach for Joe, the sleepless tossing and turning, the beseeching look backwards that begs the other to do the same, who then is the other that we look back to, that we supplicate, that we beg to stay? Is it just our own sleepless self, the self that is yoked to another, that yearns by way of being? Or is it our own sleepless body, the one that hammering a nail nails itself? That is, hammering on the other, do we turn out to be pounding down on the self, or rather hanging ourselves at the crux of hate and love, that vast oceanic bruise whose remnant is the wound delivered early and long ago. And what is the wound? So I read this poem many times before it occurred to me to wonder particularly about Joe Brainerd himself. I did look up the collage that gets named here, The Friendly Way, uh, and here's the cover I found. But it was not a deeply generative find for me, perhaps because I'm not saturated in the world of pop art that produced it. So Brainerd was an artist and poet. Um, he was, a very, he was very deeply tied in the milieu of art and poetry in the 60s and 70s in the midst of what is now dubbed the New York School, which consisted of many artists and writers who self-defined as queer and who looked for inspiration to surrealism, abs abstract impressionism, jazz, improvisation, all those movements that might be said define their orientation in the deep affective engagement of sitting in the darkened and unfamiliar room of disorientation. Joe Brainerd was deeply entrenched in this world and was much adored by many people. There are now as many tributes written about him as there are his own writings. I want to acknowledge his most famous work called I Remember, which was published in 1970. This is a deceptively simple piece that runs for more than 100 pages in like a list form, a catalog of memories that all begin with the phrase I remember. These memories run a gamut that is hard to describe or sum up. But suffice it to say that a sense of disorientation from a queer childhood in Oklahoma sits alongside the rushes of life that take place within and without the self then and later in New York. So here are just a few passages. I remember the first drawing I remember doing. It was of a bride with a very long train. I remember my first cigarette. It was a Kent up on a hill in Tulsa, Oklahoma with Ron Paget. I remember my first erections. I thought I had some terrible disease or something. I remember the only time I ever saw my mother cry. I was eating apricot pie. I remember Judy. I remember having a big crush on Judy and discovering that she was embarrassed to be seen with me, so I stopped asking her out. I remember Bill Haley and Rock the Clock. I remember the thin gold ankle bracelets. I remember white trash. I remember nylon runs. I remember looking at myself in a mirror and becoming a total stranger. I remember having a crush on a boy in my Spanish class who had a pair of olive green suede shoes with brass buckles, just like a pair I had, Flag Brothers. I never said one word to him the entire year. I remember sweaters thrown over shoulders and sunglasses propped up on heads. I remember boat neck sweaters. I remember queer as a $3 bill. I remember wood, wooden nickels. I remember changing my name to Bo Jaynard for about one week. I remember not being able to pronounce mirror. I remember wanting to change my name to Jacques Bernard. I remember when I used to sign my paintings by Joe. I remember a dream of meeting a man made out of very soft yellow cheese, and when I went to shake his hand, I just pulled his whole arm off, which is actually where the book ends. Um, so I've excerpted passages from the start, middle, and the very end of I Remember, but it really is hard to do justice to the movement of it, the way it intertwines the mundane and the mortifying, the commercial and the deeply personal, 
the sadness and exhilaration of looking back on, remembering, picking up the limbs and bits of life, and awarding to each its place in the chain of narrative that becomes a series of fragmented and even silly acts of self-constituting. Paul Oster, in an introduction to the text, writes, I remember, it seems so obvious now, so self-evident, so fundamental and even ancient, as if the magic formula had been known ever since the invention of written language. Indeed, I remember is surely as obvious as I hate and I love, but it likewise explores the complexities of having and being a self that one does not always recognize, a self that is not always recognized by society at large, that is not always placed where we are told by the world it should be placed. Brainerd's I remember forefronts a desire to become oriented and to do so in this moment, this present tense, whenever this moment is, by looking back or by being perennially backwards looking. So here we are again, examining the stance of memory, of looking back, of begging to be looked back at in return. If we continue to orient ourselves backwards, we find that ancient Greek lyric and elegiac poetry also makes the backwards-oriented gaze or glance constitutive of its structuring of subjective affect. There are, for example, several places in the archaic poetry of Sappho where we might consider the orientation frame by the act of remembering. So Sappho 1, 94, and 96 would all fit the bill. I focus here, though, just on the end of Sappho 16 where we see not just the affect of longing through the act of remembering, but also the gesture of turning toward the one who is turning away, the gesture that opens the gash of longing in the first place. This is the end of the poem. Reminding me now of Anactoria who is gone, I would rather see her lovely step and the radiant sparkle of her face than all the war chariots in Lydia and soldiers battling in arms. This is the less well-preserved and perhaps accordingly less well-known part of the poem. The poem famously opens with a preamble through which we learn that the beauty of a thing is accounted for by one's desire for it. So this is some say a host of horsemen, others say a host of foot soldiers, and still others say one of ships is the finest thing on the dark earth. I say it is whatever one desires. Desire, in other words, is the defining feature of the desired thing. Affect makes object. Hence, Helen, for all her beauty, is seen in this poem in a pose of flight, defined by her own longing. The poem also shows the gravity of what she leaves behind, for she has in mind neither her child nor her parents. So the poem goes on. Everyone can understand this. Consider Helen far surpassing the beauty of mortals, left behind the best man of all to sail away to Troy. She remembered neither daughter nor dear parents as Aphrodite perhaps led her away unbending mind lightly. We are meant to understand, in other words, that Helen has abandoned the heft of the past and future generations, that whole normative, unfurling family structure, all that is meant to establish the future as consistent with the past. Compelled by desire, Helen's leaving becomes an act of lightness, kufos, and perhaps an unburdening. Note, that, note the lack of desired objects here. Helen is not the object herself of desire in this poem, but neither is her lover Paris. The poem remembers only what is left behind. When at last we find desire oriented toward an actual object, it is not Helen's, but the speaker's desire. And her orientation is not a flight forward, but a fervent desire to look back and see her beloved return her gaze again. Her Anactoria, the beloved, is constructed solely through the memory of a past that is in motion too, through the step and shimmer that is now metonymic of the woman who is gone. But let us not stop there, for it is critical, I think, that we consider not only the elegance of longing with Sappho, but also take account of the awkward and even unpleasant backward glance of Theognis, our perennially disappointed elegist from the seventh century BCE. Boy, thanks to your lust, you have lost your fine mind. You disgrace me before my friends. But how you did refresh me for a short time when from a storm I took shelter in you, in quiet, pressed on by night. So the speaker here is abandoned and discouraged, embarrassed and ashamed. That's the basic gist of the first couplet, which would make good sense if it appeared in the pages of the book Ugly Feelings, which is written by Cyan Nye, who is our keynote speaker today. These might not be the emotions we prize, but they live there in that place of disorientation, expressed as social shame and anger-fueled abuse. 
But the second couplet, that's the one that looks back, right? That's the Orphic Odyssean moment of return, of shelter from the storm. Note how the phrase, a short time, mikron kronon, is sonically framed by a kaisura on one side and a sense break marked by a high dot in the Greek on the other. And note also how the phrase, of a short time, of relief, pleasure, encounter, looks back to Achilles' entreaty with the dead Patroclus, who sees him and begs that they embrace for just a little while. The moment longed for, looked back to, is always mikron, always a small, light, fleeting thing. Note the brief sensory relief of the cool verb anepsukas, you refreshed me. The word itself, a quiet, very still port, set in the pose of the poem itself. This couplet might be said, through its active memory, to be a slight solve for the otherwise never-ending wound that is the authorial identity haunting the Theognidia. Following the thread of this wound, the threaded wound, brings me to the most coherent account of such a wound that I know, the thread of a wound offered by Plato's Aristophanes in the Symposium, and this is my last text for today. Plato's Aristophanes tells a story of how it is that men and men, and women and women, and men and women, came to long for one another, or to feel desire, eros. He begins by explaining that there were once not one, uh, sorry, not two, but three kinds of people, and that they were all round and made up of two sides. One kind of person was man-man, another was woman-woman, and a third was man-woman. So we get a lot of details in the text about their hands and their legs and their sex organs and how they walked and how they ran and how and why they were spherical. We learn, too, that they were proud and ambitious, these spherical people, and titan-like, they attempted an attack on the Olympian gods. After they failed to depose the gods, Zeus sought to punish and control them. Hence, he cut them in half, creating the two-legged personhood with which we are now familiar. Aristophanes' people then have an originating wound from this primordial cut and keep a scar to mark it, since Zeus commanded Apollo to heal most of the wound that results from being cut in half, but to leave the navel, like a drawstring on a pouch, ever in its wrinkled state, as a, a reminder of what happened long ago. At last, the birth of desire is announced. Eros, says Aristophanes, is born into every human being. It calls back the halves of our original nature together. It tries to make one out of two and heal the wound of human nature. In this simple conclusion to a complex tale, Plato's Aristophanes poses a history of longing that establishes people as lovers and as such as haunted by loss, wounded by it, in fact, and oriented forever to look back to that which they have lost. But it would not be news to any queer poet, painter, or to Achilles, say, or to Orpheus, let alone to Lot's wife, that we cannot heal, seal off, or, uh, or fix the wound of human nature. Not by remembering, not by looking back, not by decoding, not by a forward or backward looking orientation, not by begging, not by hating, not by loving, well, maybe by loving. Thank you. <clears throat> So my, my question is not very well articulated, but um, I'm thinking about, okay, so Lot's wife, Orpheus, those are stories about, as far as sort of the simple understanding is that looking back is a not trusting. So it's not that we're not going forward, mm -hmm. that we don't have our eyes forward, but that we're not trusting, like we sort of want to make sure that what we care about is really with us in the present. And, um, and that's what I see going on in not, it's not the right way to say it about grief, but that there's something about the present in grief that's, it seems like people are stuck in the past, but actually, and we, you know, you and I have talked about this, but they're experiencing a different kind of present. So I guess, like, does that fit all your examples? <laughs> um, is that the right way to think about it? Is there something else? I mean, just to tie it back to like the idea of looking back, um, which yeah. I don't really understand the Greek metaphor of time at all, if you want to say about that. Yeah, I remember learning this in high school. The Greek metaphor is, well, because you can see everything that's already happened, but you can't see what hasn't happened, you're like, wait, how, you must be, you're walking backwards. <laughs> like, we live our lives just walking backwards. So yeah. I don't know, I think it's neat. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
uh, no, it's a great question. I guess that th that's interesting, and I'm going to have to think about it a lot because I've never thought of like Lot's wife. And it's, it makes more sense, I guess, for Orpheus. But I, still, I've never thought of the looking back as being not trusting. Um, and so I, I'm going to have to think about that a bit to see if that changes anything for me. I always thought of it as being an, an unwillingness, an unwillingness to not look back, mm -hmm. as it were, like an unwillingness to like be in the world as someone who's looking forward instead of looking back. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly, uh, often in the Orpheus story is told as a kind of morality tale. And the morality tale is he made a mistake of not accepting the word. And so, yeah, I will have to think about that. I mean, I think that, I think what I'm trying to get at on some level is that it looks like what you have is these exceptional tales of, look, this particular person had this crazy set of events happen, like Lot's wife, you know, mm -hmm. and look <laughs> back and, oh, she got turned into a pillar of salt and that's very unusual. <laughs> um, but that, in fact, that, that looking back is pretty constitutive of just a certain way of being alive. And it, it, got, it shades over into just how, in remembering, we kind of constitute ourselves. Um, so that often it seems like you're looking back at this person or that person that you lost, but what you're doing is building a self. Yeah. Um, and so it, it's, yeah, so it, it's, it's kind of treated as if you're not in the present, but you're making your present yeah. by doing this. Yeah. Um, That's helpful. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, this is a delightful uh, presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, my question, I suppose, is focused on uh, the queerness of the time. Uh, because in one sense, like all people mourn and are sad about lost loved ones, and people are always remembering and looking back. Yeah. Uh, and there is certainly a, a sort of like, progressive thought of only looking forward a la Heather Love, right? Where that, the, to, to look back at all is a sort of queer act. Yeah. Uh, but I guess I want to focus in on the, the Greek metaphor, just because it's so different than the, the same, way. The, yeah. yeah. The, it's so different than the way we think about it now. Uh, of t in order to look into the future, you have to look behind you. So we got a lot of pre in your presentation about um, remembering and looking back into the past. Is there any way that the the metaphor extends into this, like looking behind you is also looking into the future? Like the, it's at least at the point of reception, mm -hmm. there seems to be a confusion yeah. of time. I mean, uh, at the point of reception, you mean like literally for us? For us, because I mean, I would assume for the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, that. Opsis isn't strange, right? This is a, a sort of common metaphor yeah. of conceiving yeah, no, it's time. It's just language. I've yeah. never seen it. But for us, it's weird. For us, it's weird. So yeah. what happens when we as moderns are thinking with this ancient Greek metaphor? What does it do to our sense of what is behind and what is in front, what is past and what is future? That's a great and difficult question. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, well, this may not be like the mood in which you're asking this, but I think that like the way I remember it being introduced to me was as a kind of um, well, I, to put it back in sort of like maybe over our something queer terms. There's a way that we're meant to think that we know what the future will hold, or at least we know what the future should hold. Like um, we should get married and have children, and we should like march along the thing, and you know, and that. And that it's like our job is to kind of be part of this tele teleology that brings us to the expected and good future. Um, and so part of what a lot of queer theory, I think, is doing is, is looking at the ways you, turn, you can turn off of that. Like, what are the escapes from that? Um, so when the thing was introduced to me, I, I think it was in high school by my high school teacher, this idea, it was kind of like, a, like this wake-up call about how you didn't... Um, that the Greek idea understood how little we know about what we're walking into. It really understood that we are absolutely ignorant and that any presumption we make about what's going to happen next week or in two weeks is our mistake. Um, we can see really well what is behind us. I don't, it's not really like, so crane your neck and look, you know, it's, it's more just like, look, you can't tell. So like make the most of this thing in front of you that is the past, what you do know make the most of how you can see that, I guess. But again, so the, I guess I, maybe it was because it was high school. It felt like it was in a sort of moralizing moment 
like you dummy, you can't see what's going to happen, you know. Um, <laughs> but that's that's how it lodged in my head, and I've never really found anything on it except for the word itself to like help me understand it better. Is this one of those like uh, classic urban legends that get passed down? From I thought it was. I thought it was one of those high school things because I looked for it, and then but it's it's like in the lexicon. It's in the lexicon, right? So I mean, it's just it's in the language. Um, I just, I, yeah, they just didn't think it was that remarkable. I think. Uh, thank you. So I, I'm really interested in this complexity of temporality, and especially in the case of the Iliad with Achilles, because he does not have this future ahead of him. He knows that he is not going to follow this normal path, and that he's going to die. And now he knows, right? Yes. Yes. And I am wondering about how this affects his perception of the past and his memories and this idea of like keeping Patroclus alive and trying to avoid the present becoming the past. Yeah, well, I think a that's way. a beautiful way to put that. But I think that, yeah, that's like precisely what he's doing, right? Because he, the like at first the body is not buried. And then the bot of Patroclus, that is. And then it is buried. But even so, he won't really eat. He won't gather. What he's doing is like seeking not to move on from the moment of loss, which is a very, I mean, actually, it's well, well played, Homer, because that's what a lot of people do. But, um, but he's, like, he's trying very much to stay as close to the past as he can by not normalizing again. Um, and so even if his future is now an, his future is known to him only because of what's happened with Patroclus, right? Up until that point, it had, it, there was no decision point. Um, so now the future is known, but he has an unwillingness to enter into it, right? To like take the steps that, that would, to sit and eat with people and to forget a little bit and to, um, to normalize. So I think, yeah, the idea that he's trying to like stay glued to the past somehow is like a really nice way to describe those, those books until finally, as Emily has written about, until he has the encounter with Priam that allows him to kind of move forward. Um, thank you. Thank you. So I have a brief comment about the like language thing, which is that like we actually have it too. So like the future is in front of us, the past is behind us, but the future, but the past is also before, and the future is after. Before, like before oh, yeah, and after. Oh yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah, like we do, we have sort of both of them. Yeah, right. Got actually. it. Actually, um, <laughs> yeah, I'll think about that. Later. <laughs> so we have both of them. Yeah. We're like turning around back and forth, maybe. Yeah, we're all um. confused all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so there's that. Uh, my question is about like I was really interested in the connection between sleep and death that you're drawing that is sort of different from the kind of like typical one where like sleep can be a metaphor for death or death can be a metaphor for sleep, like the sleeping person and the dead person are somehow kind of linked. Here it's like the unsleeping person is the person who is grieving for the dead. Yeah. And so I was wondering like, do you see that sort of like imagery around sleep and death? Are those two images somehow like connected or linked or just sort of like different ways of sort of like taking this fact of everyday existence and connecting it to like mortal experience? That's a great question. Thank you. Uh, just today, one of my students accused me of being obsessed with sleep because of them. <laughs> Which, well, it's not wrong. Um, uh, yeah, no, you're right. So sleep and death have this like are thought of as as, as if related, right? There's that famous uh, vase painting where they're carrying off the body of a dead soldier together. Um, yeah. So I, it's really always just all by itself, like separate from this paper, fascinated me that you have insomnia in the very first Greek work ever. You know, that that's just a very important thing to frame. Um, and then it gets framed again and again. What is it, I mean, so it's, it's, a, it's a widely felt human experience, but like what's, what does it show, like what does it exhibit about our, like our self in this world? And I mean, I, in a difficult way, I think it's like the most conscious we ever are. It's like when our sense, our consciousness as being alive is the slowest and most grating and like the worst, you know, and the most anxiety, you know, it's like every, everything you feel in your body, every worry you feel in your head like explodes open and becomes large, 
right? So for the most part, for Achilles, we don't have to hear, was he on his side? Was he turned left? Was he turned right? It's only when he can't sleep that it suddenly matters because he's feeling it that he turns this way, but then he turns that way. And then so it's just like this explosion of, con of the human consciousness um, in a sort of unpleasant way, but that's, you know. Um, and so I, I guess I like, the way I think what, you know, what's being shaped here is that the feeling of looking back slash of feeling grief, which are not the same but not totally different, um, is like it happens to be framed too at the moment when we most feel, when we most are ourselves, which is an unfortunately when we're, uh, when we're awake at night and can't get to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you for that question. I was um, wondering, I noticed, or this could have been something that you had explained and missed, but and that I had missed. But um, the way that you describe the grief of the AIDS crisis, um, the or uh, and the kind of the communal knowledge, um, as well as the you know constant grief, and the idea that, or uh, and also the idea that you could be next. Would you say that that's also mirrored in um, Achilles' experience mm -hmm. with his, him that's seeing that and being stuck there? Um, so do you mean his singular experience because it's known to him that with Patroclus' death and his killing Hector, he'll be next kind yeah. of? Yeah. Ah, that's really, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you might even say, I thought, um, that in a case of war, where there's going to be a lot of death, that, that the same reality comes to bear. Um, but I would, but I don't think Achilles sees himself as like one of the many who will die. So, so but yes, I that that's beautiful. Yes, I think that because Patroclus' death is absolutely inseparable from his own. Everybody knows that. It keeps being said that um, that the you could apply the same um, sort of replacement of mourning with melancholia with him as as uh, the scholar Monica Pearl did to the AIDS crisis situation. So that's great. Thank you. Well, thank you guys. You're a great audience. And thank you for the question. <laughs>